Good morning and welcome to Being Human. My name's Nat Rich and I am joined here with the fabulous Mark Devlin. How are you, Mark? Hey, Nat. Not too bad, actually. Uh, I'm getting involved in some music type stuff. I've been wallowing in doom and gloom and dreadful material for far too many weeks. Yeah. So over the past few days, I've actually been taking a bit of time out for myself and going back to my roots with music and throwing myself into a few music based projects. And I'm feeling a lot better, a lot more grounded Good. and uh, a lot more centered as a result. Yeah, I listened to one of your podcasts the other day and you were very clear and you said, you know, thank you for everyone sending me stuff, but I cannot do it at the moment. I'm just switching off. You have to take on another route because it is it's hectic out there at the moment, isn't it? It is. And it's draining spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically draining yes. to marinate in this information the whole time. And I've reached a status now where, as I've mentioned in a couple of my recent videos, people seem to think that it's their duty to send me every piece of dreadful doom and gloom laden material about no. what our overlords and slave masters want to do to us. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much of that that you can take when your inbox is filled with it day by day before yeah. it starts to have an effect on you. And well, I won't be sending you anything. No, <laughs> I'll well, leave I, you alone. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and it's got to the stage where I've got to know the people that send me the positive, uplifting stuff, reasons for optimism and hope. I recognize yeah. the names in the inbox and they're the messages I open first every day because they're going to send me something that actually makes me feel like it's worthwhile continuing through the day rather than the 95% of dreadful stuff that I have to dutifully wade through uh, yes. and wallow in every day. So I have reached the point where I do need to take a bit of a back seat and I do need to take a bit of time out for myself and just repair and heal if I'm to be of use to anyone else or to creation itself. You've got to look yeah. after yourself first. No, that's a solid message just before we even get into anything, um, because we are going to I'm going to touch. I'm going to keep it quite high level emotion uh, on this one. But there are parts of your life and you know what you do. So you are a DJ, music journalist and uh, a podcaster. There's so much information out there on you online. So I didn't want to kind of tap onto too many questions that most people I've already asked you and I kind of wanted to make it a bit more of a natural approach really and uh, just go down a few a few little areas and see where we get to um, okay. but first of all I wanted to say so for anybody out there this is Mark's book The Music Musical Truth it is huge and I got David Icke's book uh, The Answer around the same time so these two came into my uh, my zone and I thought oh my god it's going to take me forever to get through them but Highly, highly recommended and uh, mind blowing information in there for anybody that's looking for, you know, the truth. Anybody that's feeling like they've got questions and answers, you have not missed a rabbit hole when you've gone down that journey. You've really put your your heart and soul into it. Um, so I wanted to ask you first and foremost, just to introduce you very briefly. What before you kind of woke up and went into this world of looking at or looking for truth and going deeper into the musical world? Can you tell me a little bit about your life just before? you woke up what kind of stuff were you doing what was your mindset like what kind of you know life were you living well I've always been a music fan and I think the cards were on the table when I brought my first record at the age of five which was Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody first time round. so I was someone that always used to watch Top of the Pops and I tell the story in Musical Truth actually in the early chapter that I used to get given my Sunday evening bath time uh, by my mum every week when I was a very small boy and she used to have the radio on in the bathroom and it was the chart countdown on Radio 1. So I was exposed to pop music that was in the charts from a very young age and it really had an impact on me and the memories that I can just bring back instantaneously from previous times in my life just through listening to a certain record speaks to the power of music to conjure up memories and nostalgia and you know that stuff never leaves you i can remember lyrics from songs that i heard on the radio 40 years ago and they're still with me wow. so this convinced me that i wanted to do something with music i really wanted to work in some way in the realm of music and in my teenage years i decided i wanted to become a dj because i wanted to communicate the passion and the enthusiasm that i had for the music that i loved to other people i think 99 percent of djs will tell you that's the reason why they got into that business because they're so excited by music they want other people to feel that too so I embarked on the path of trying to set myself up as a DJ and it took a few years. It wasn't easy. There were a lot of hurdles to overcome. Uh, I used to be very shy, actually, and very uh, introverted. I still am, really, at, at, at my core. Uh, hard to believe sometimes. Thank you for letting me video you. 
<laughs> yeah. You well, think. sometimes I find myself up on stage there at these protest events with 20,000 people in front of me and I'm addressing them and they're hanging on my every word. And I'm thinking, hell there, how did my life come to this? Because I used to be terrified of the idea of public speaking or going on the radio or anything like that. But through my love of music, I got myself set up as a radio DJ and then a club DJ. And I had many good years going out there playing this music. So I settled on black music like R&B, hip hop, reggae, dance or soulful house, that kind of stuff. That's what I was known for playing. And for around about 20 years, I had a full time career traveling around the world playing this music. I had moderate levels of success. I was never a household name. I was never an A-lister like Pete Tong or Carl Cox or Fatboy Slim or anyone like that. But I did OK out of it and I got to travel. I went to 40 odd different countries around the world to play gigs all up and down the UK, did radio shows. I was a music journalist as well, and that served me very well. And if we went back in time 15 years ago, my main reason for living, if you'd asked me back then, would be the next gig, the next party. Mm -hmm. All I could think about is when I can next get out there and play some more music. So my priorities have totally shifted in life now, and that just seems like another lifetime away. And what happened was, Around about 2007, 2008, I'd started to ask some of the big questions in life, such as, what is this life? What is the meaning of it? What are we doing here? What are we? What's our true nature? And what's really going on in the world? Who really runs things? Because by that point, I'd figured out that governments were controlled by higher powers that dictated to them what they need to do. They weren't actually in control of things. Mm. And this sparked all kinds of questions in my mind. And I wanted to piece all the uh, puzzle pieces together. And I was reading the books of David Icke around about that time. And by, by the time I got to 2010, everything had kind of coalesced and come together. And there was a point where I could just see the big picture. It's like everything snapped into place. Suddenly, the last puzzle piece was put in the jigsaw, and I got it. I got how this world is structured. I got how life seems so unfair and so unjust, and there's suffering and there's inequality everywhere because there's supposed to be. It's by design. It's not accident. It's not random that these things happen. It's structured to be that way. And I finally understood this. And so in 2010, it's probably the same for many other people when they first wake up. You feel the need to evangelize. You feel the need to shout from the rooftops what you yourself have discovered. So in those early days, I was speaking to everyone I could about what I'd come to understand about the true nature of this world. I was speaking to people on trains. People sat next to me on planes. I was just speaking to strangers, everyone I knew. And after a few weeks, I realized this wasn't necessarily the best approach. People have to come to this process in their own space and time, the same way I did. And so I kind of ease off from that and, and worked out some better ways of getting the truth out there. And what I really wanted to understand was how uh, my realizations of what really goes on in this world feed into the corporate music business of which I'd been a part, because I'd realized by 2010 that the music business is deeply corrupt. Uh, there are all kinds of dark occult elements involved in it. It's mm -hmm. used to a very large extent for mind control and societal programming. And the A-list household name artists that we're all familiar with are absolutely controlled. They're doing the bidding of their corporate overlords. They're not freely expressing themselves. They're doing what they're told according to agendas. Mm -hmm. So I needed to understand more about how these dynamics played out. And that formed the basis of that first book, Musical Truth, Volume 1. So I started researching it in earnest in about 2011. And it was 2014 when I knuckled down to the actual writing of it. And I finally got it out there in early 2016. And it was a very satisfying process to uh, finally unleash that book on the world. And then volume two followed two years later in early 2018, because I realized there was more of the story to tell. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it all into that first volume. And I'm now at the point where as soon as I can find the time and as soon as I can be free of all these distractions from all this COVID nonsense, which has dominated my life this year, I want to knuckle down to the writing of volume three because mm -hmm. Musical Truth volume three is on the cards. It's already written in my mind. It's all up here. It's just a case of getting it from here into the computer and onto the printed page. So that's the next project.
Thank you. Well, I love the fact that how much you, you know, you're a journalist, how much you really do research comes across extremely well in a lot of the podcasts and, and your mind for just bringing out lyrics perfect to the conversation that you're having shows me, you know, a, a natural level of intelligence. And I think what what we're going through at the moment and what we're seeing on, a, you know, in a large scale in amongst all of the confusion that we have here on planet Earth right now, a lot of people are naturally asking questions and a lot of people are limited to certain answers because they're not willing to look in other areas. And that's something definitely that you don't do. You do go down areas that wouldn't necessarily um, be obvious to the other person. But do you feel that, uh, you know, me working on I Am Sound, which is my radio station, a lot of that kind of has come from me following the music and me following just what seems like breadcrumbs. And, and it's really taken me in a different way. Do you feel that the music has led you or is it your curiosity around the subject that's led you? Because the two have intertwined very cleverly with vibration and energy. But what would you say has kind of been the main driver? Would you say it was the music or would it be the, just the curiosity of that? It's the fact that I'm writing about music and I still love music. So the subject interests me greatly even if it's dark and devastating and there's some very unsettling elements to it, which clearly there are, as you will have seen from the book, it brings me no pleasure to report things like demonic possession and trauma-based mind control and satanic ritual abuse playing out in the music industry. It brings me no pleasure to reveal that certain high-profile artists have almost certainly been subject to uh, you know, horrific traumatic programming in their early years. But I still find the subject fascinating nevertheless. It reminds me of a comment that an old editor of mine made. We're going back about 30 years now. So it was my first proper day job. I worked for a business magazine. Uh, it was a trade publishing house. And I started as a reporter, worked my way up to assistant editor, and then eventually editor of one of these uh, magazines that the company published. And I got my group editor to write a character appraisal of me when I was going for another job. And he said, uh, the thing about me that struck him the most is that when I have my interest and curiosity sparked by something that I find genuinely fascinating, there's no stopping me. I just mm -hmm. delve fully into it and immerse myself in it completely. Yeah. And that hasn't changed to this day. So that was a comment that was made 30 years ago. It stayed with me. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been so intense this year in my research into all this corona nonsense, the, the scamdemic. And that's why I've reached the point now where I really need to take a bit of a breather because I've been very intense. It's part of my personality. When I find something that interests me and sparks my curiosity, I give it my all. I just dive into it 110%. So that's what fueled uh, the work that I've done with Musical Truth. That's why I'm planning the third book now mm. because it's a massive subject area and it's one that really speaks to me. And getting spiritual and metaphysical about it, I feel that this is my reason for being here. I feel this is my calling. I get many messages from people uh, very kindly saying that they feel what I'm doing now is the reason why I came here and agreed to incarnate into this reality. And I'd be inclined to agree. I think I was the man for the job because everything about my background and everything about what got me to this point speaks to me being groomed and prepared, ready to do this job. So I feel like I'm in service to God and creation here through doing mm -hmm. this stuff. Have you ever been kind of... Uh we talk a lot now, I think a lot of people now are talking about religion and they're talking about God and they're looking at God in a different way. I think they're hoping that there is one because there's no other real way out of this situation that a lot of people can see. But have you ever had any um, kind of resistances to to kind of the godly side of your life and, and the kind of magic that shows up for you? Have you ever had any doubts in that? Or is that just something that you've always had since you were younger that you've started to follow that that line of thought? Well, no, I've been through many different spiritual phases in my life. So um, my family was never religious, so I wasn't born into it in any way. Mm -hmm. I went to a Church of England school when I was little, uh, nominally. So we went to church every now and again, and we were taught about Jesus and God. Uh, but I never really embraced it that much. But in 1990, I had what I considered at the time to be a kind of spiritual awakening. And I felt very differently about the world and about my place in it. And I had no idea what to do with it at the time. I didn't understand what was happening to me. And at the time, I had an aunt who was a very devout Christian. And when I mentioned this to her, she seized on it immediately and said, oh, it's a calling from the Lord. You need to come into the church. 
And she attended this evangelical Christian church at the time. Mm. And so she kind of coerced me to come along with her. And I fell into that whole set. And through what people were saying to me, they had me believe that I'd been born again. I was a born again Christian within that faith. And so I attended that church for four years out of a sense of obligation and duty because I felt it's just what I needed to do. But by the end of it, I had become very disillusioned with organized religion because I felt there was a lot of hypocrisy in that church. I felt that people who attended weren't practicing what they preached. Uh, there were a lot of things about what the Bible was teaching that didn't make sense to me. It seemed to be self-contradictory. And so I left that church four years later, having become an atheist. I turned completely against the idea of religion. And so I spent about the next 15 years as an atheist. And I actually got into the work of Richard Dawkins. Mm. And I deludedly confer, uh, uh, concurred with him that uh, life is just a random accident of nothingness and that the earth is just this cold, heartless rock that uh, has no meaning and no purpose. And it's a very nihilistic uh, viewpoint, but it's one that actually made sense to me and resonated with me for about 15 years. And that process came to an end round about 2008 when I entered into the process that I mentioned earlier, where I started having all these big questions about life. And mm -hmm. as I looked into aspects of truth and alternative research, I came to realize that, of course, there's a creator. Of course, there's what people would call a god. There's a generative force. There's a divine uh, uh, aspect to our lives, and we are expressions of it. And so I've been on that path for the last 12 years or so, where I've absolutely accepted that we are individuated aspects of creation of mm -hmm. divine consciousness. So many people would choose to call that God. I don't adhere to any uh, orthodox religions anymore, but uh, I'm very far from what you would call an atheist now. So I've been through all these different processes. Mm -hmm. Wow. So uh, you're a man of lyrics. You bring lyrics in everything that you do. And the power of word is something in my life that I've been you know, learning a lot about recently the vibrations, the energy from when we say things, the effect of our words, the, you know, the miscommunication. And I, I look at what's going on on the planet now, and I feel that largely we have, you know, many problems, but our biggest problem is our lack of being able to communicate correctly. And without being able to communicate correctly, however we choose to communicate, if it's not given correctly, it's not received correctly. And a lot of the the programming, as it were, and a lot of the stuff that's happening today has, I believe, I was, you know, I was looking the other day at a lot of the music and the titles for some of the songs that we've raved to over the years. And a lot of those titles of tracks, they're perfect for the time of now. They're perfectly aligned with what's happening now. And I feel like the music's been speaking to us in some way over time. And obviously reading your book, you've got some mentions of David Bowie and, you know, lots of things that he's mentioned. A lot of people channel um, through music and lyrics and, you know, and words of a different kind. What are your thoughts on the channels and whether some are more of a God presence and some are more of a kind of a, an evil presence in some way? What's your kind of difference, sorry, the difference between the two and, and where have you seen that crop up in your work? Yeah, I do get into that in the first book there. I've cited some examples of musicians who have spoken of seemingly channeling songs from out there in the ether somewhere. They don't know where it comes from. David Bowie has made comments like this. Uh, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant have talked about it, of Led Zeppelin, with specific reference to their track Stairway to Heaven. Uh, you know, uh, Robert Plant talked of channeling stuff uh, in the lyrics from that, and he didn't really know where the song had come from at the end of the day. And I can relate to that because... A lot of the time when I get up there and do these speeches now at protest events, I find myself speaking words and I'm not entirely sure where they've come from. And I can watch back a recording of it afterwards and think, well, I said that. That sounds really profound. I had no idea I was going to say that. And I do put out a kind of intention prayer before I embark on any of these speeches. It used to be the case when I did presentations based around my work. I would always speak out to creation beforehand and ask for truthful information to flow through me, for me to be used as a conduit for that. And I would always make the point that I wanted only the one true creative force to be uh, channeling through me, 
nothing unwanted would be allowed in. I don't want any demonic entities coming in. So I'm very clear and specific about that because I think what has happened with many of these musicians is because of the dark and uh, deeply occultic nature of the industry, when you really get down to it and those that run it, they put themselves in a position where they could well be channeling information and lyrics and messages through from some very dark entities. So in the same way that you can be drawing stuff through from creation that is beneficial and benevolent to humankind, the opposite, of course, can also be true. Everything is polarities. Uh, everything is duality. So in the same way that sound itself can be used for healing mm -hmm. and is the very basis of this, this um, reality that we're experiencing, everything is based around sound and light energy. And that can be used for great good and uh, great positive means, but it can also be used for evil and for harmful means if it's in the hands of somebody somebody with malevolent intent. Mm -hmm. So it's the same dynamic when it comes to song lyrics. And I do feel that some musicians have pulled through stuff, they channeled stuff from out there somewhere, which have put very profound, very uplifting messages out there uh, for humanity. And I think really we can tell the difference when we're listening to a song between one that is there with uh, misleading, malevolent intent and one that genuinely resonates with us and that we find uplifting and inspirational. I certainly can tell the difference. And I think it's an instinctive thing that most people that listen to lots of music can tell. So some songs just feel right. Others can feel a bit unsettling. They can put you on edge. And others are just endlessly fascinating and enigmatic. And you really don't know what the lyrics mean. You know, the Eagles Hotel California has been endlessly scrutinized for the past nearly 50 years. And so many different interpretations have been put on the lyrics. Uh, it's truly fascinating. And songs can really do that. And I feel in the same way that many mediums and psychics talk of channeling through information from ascended masters and spirit guides and this kind of thing, people that are highly attuned to music can bring through songs in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I do uh, because I find song lyrics just appearing in my mind randomly by the day. It's almost and, like you get shot with them when I've heard your interviews. You're like, oh, I got another lyric. And you give yeah. it and it perfectly aligns with yeah. the conversation. It's incredible. Invariably, the lyric that I get speaks to either my own personal circumstances on that day or more likely mm -hmm. the wider picture of what humanity is going through or what the nation is going through at that time. So yeah. just to give you an example, I mentioned that today's lyric that just popped into my head was Genesis land of confusion which is a single they put out in 1986 just got a few lyrics here so you know the most potent lyrics from the song uh include there's too many men too many people making too many problems and not much love to go round tell me why this is the land of confusion i mean if that doesn't speak to the united Perfect. kingdom in november 2020 <laughs> i don't know what does and then uh, the song goes on to say i remember long ago when the sun was shining and the stars were bright all through the night and the sound of your laughter as I held you tight so long ago. And we're talking now about the before times because mm. the year has transformed so much. Yeah. And people are talking about uh, 2019 being BC before Corona <laughs> because <laughs> it's like the timeline has been divided now and 2020 really has. signals the end of the way things used to be. And the start of whatever lies ahead of us. But mm. so many of us have pinings and nostalgic hankerings towards what life used to be. You know, the sound of your laughter as I held you tight so long ago, because that pre-COVID world feels so long ago now to so many mm. of us. And then the last part of the lyric goes, I won't be coming home tonight. My generation will put it right. We're not just making promises that we know we'll never keep. And that mm. speaks to the fact that those of us of our generation that are determined to take right action and do what we know needs to be done mm -hmm. are the ones that are going to have to sort this out, are the ones that are going to determine which path plays out for humanity from this point on. So yeah. all of those points came to me through that song. And I think there's so much relevance there to those lyrics that were written, you know, 34 years ago. Yeah. And this is something that I've I've had in my own, just literally in the last two weeks, feeling 
really connected to look at old school music, especially from the 90s in terms of like house music. And a lot of the lyrics and a lot of the words fit perfectly for the time that we have now. And I started writing a letter and I felt like I, it was almost like I, I couldn't finish the letter because it kept coming through me and it was just so overwhelming, but uh, to the point where I was crying. But I had this idea where this the music was talking to me and it was getting me to write a letter. And it was telling people that you know we can't forget the music it's the music is the answer essentially and you know music is the one thing that will get us back together but that's the first thing that's really been wiped out this year is you know events are off music's off you can't do this you can't do that when it's related to music I think even in Scotland they stopped playing music um, in many of the venues because they, in case you sang along and you spat in someone and it was just it was so crazy but the the real feeling that I get right now and especially with I Am Sound which is also you know breadcrumb and I've just followed the path is that if people truly understood that they were vibration, if they truly understood the nature of this environment, they would see things very clearly and they'd understand that by raising their vibration, by feeling that happiness, they can actually change the state collectively in the world. But not many people, because when you go down that path, you can kind of go down in two ways. One is a very kind of sciencey way. So you look at the neuro um, kind of neurobiology and you look at the brain and you look at how that is. And it can be very sciencey. The other side can be slightly woo woo, shall we say, and it could go down a very esoteric path, which is just both of which blended together creates a very solid understanding of what's happening right now but you're either one or the other but this year it's amazing how many people I believe that are wanting an answer to, to what's going on and are willing to look so there's, there's a whole bunch of people waking up in all in one you know all in one go and that's it's quite traumatic but there's a whole load of people who also feel like something's not right know deep down that something is screwed and they ask the questions but they do not want to hear anything about a conspiracy or anything against them how many in terms of like your because your network's quite big how many people do you think now in your network or kind of a percentage basis who aren't listening and how many are ready to step up do you think it's it's quite a lot of people or is it still a minority on the stepping up part there's still a long way to go, and mm -hmm. I've been consistently frustrated and disappointed this year with how long it's taking for certain processes to happen. Yeah. So here we are, nearly nine months into the scamdemic now, and it's mm -hmm. so frustrating when you know, you've known from day one that this whole thing is a massive scam. I knew from day one. The minute Boris Johnson got up, got up there on that lectern on the 23rd of March and said, eh, we're all going into lockdown, folks, and we have to shut everything down. And we have to control the virus and keep keep the flatten the curve. You know, yeah. um, I've seen so many stunts from the social engineers of this world mm -hmm. that all the hallmarks and all the usual tactics and methods were present there. And I knew yeah. from the start that it was one big scam and it was going to be Crashing used to fulfill system. certain agendas. It's yeah. the same as all these false flag terror events we've had that we're told are at the hands of ISIS or IS, whatever they're called. They've been a bit quiet lately, haven't they? Wouldn't you think that uh, a pandemic would be the perfect opportunity for these dastardly terrorists who stop at nothing and, uh, you know, serve their cause and uh, will fight to the death? Wouldn't you think they'd have been causing mayhem and terror everywhere? But no, I guess they've been putting the masks on and staying at home like they're told, like good citizens, you know. Mm -hmm. But I've known since day one that this whole thing is a scam. So it's very frustrating that nine months later, it's only now that we're getting large numbers of doctors coming forward and uh, put you know blowing the whistle on it we've got certain lawyers coming forward now and starting to take action we've got uh nurses that work in hospitals that are coming forward to say they've been empty and these test centers are empty and we've got people coming out and saying the vaccine's not safe and all this why was this not happening weeks ago months ago why was this not happening in the spring the minute they tried to drop this thing on us so i'm not renowned for my patients and uh, I do find it difficult to uh, just sit back and wait for things to happen because I'm just someone that wants things to happen yesterday. So it's not happening anywhere near as quick enough as I would like or I would ever, ever have believed. But clearly the process is underway. Mm -hmm. And I've had a few personal experiences where people that I've known from the old world, the DJ world, what I did in the before times, who used to criticize and sneer and have a bit of a chuckle at my conspiracy rantings and ravings. And I'm sure they used to think I was quite entertaining with the, the outrageous things I came out with. But a few of these people have actually come to me this year 
And they've either shown an interest in the information I've been putting out, and they've been starting to ask questions. And they've said, can you tell me some more about this? Can you point me in the right direction to research this further? Or in some cases, they've actually come to me directly and personally apologized to me for wow. doubting what I had to say. And they've said, I should listen to you. I can now see that everything you've been saying is absolutely valid because I'm seeing it come true with my own eyes. And I should have listened. I'm sorry I didn't. Yeah. And with these people, I'm like, okay, thank you for being gracious enough to say that to me. That's fine. It's all good. Uh, here's some information you need to look at. Good to have you on board. So yeah. I've seen that happening. And uh, I was having a conversation last night with... Uh, couple of renegade mates so we've got this thing where we meet on a tuesday evening and up until a few weeks ago we met at a local pub we were still able to go to pubs imagine that and so we would sit in the corner of a pub and talk about all this stuff but because you can't go in pubs anymore we meet in the local bus shelter so we're like three tramps with our cans of tenants extra you know and we have our little meetings in the bus shelter and so we were chatting last night and we were asking each other, how many people do you think are getting wise to this this scam now? Mm -hmm. And one of my mates said, oh, it's got to be like 10,000 a week. It's got to be, you know, 10,000 or more people a week yeah. who are finally acknowledging that it doesn't add up what we're being told by the mainstream media and the government. There are too many contradictions. There are too many anomalies. So much of it is absurd. So much of it doesn't make sense. So much of it is in an affront to common sense. And I think it probably is. Uh, on that kind of scale now. Literally thousands of people every week are acknowledging yeah. that the old world view they held no longer applies because it's full of lies, it's full of deception, and there's more to know here. So that's got to be encouraging. Uh, again, it is disappointing to me how we just have to keep plodding along. It's just like walking through tarmac uh, mm. at a very slow rate. Uh, yeah. watching, you know, waiting for everyone else to catch up and waiting for everyone else to finally realise that the BBC Evening News is not telling you the truth. They are lying to you. There are other agendas here. So we're getting there. We're just not getting there quick enough. And yeah. another source of disappointment to me, keeping it music based, is how few famous musicians mm -hmm. are coming out and saying anything vaguely critical about what the government is doing to us. So there's been a small handful, and I've called out their names many times. Sir Van Morrison, you know, kudos, respect. He's been very critical of the lockdown measures. He's put out songs about it. Uh, Noel Gallagher has had some things to say about the absurdity of mask wearing. Fair play. Uh, right said Fred, who would ever have believed it? But right said Fred are coming out and, you know, criticising what the government's doing. Uh, Ian Brown of the Stone Roses, great guy, you know, true musical hero, Ian McNabb of the Icicle Works, and there'll be a few others. Wiley, the grime artist, has had some things to say as well, but very few others. And isn't it amazing that we're in train to think of musicians, particularly those from certain genres. So if you think of punk, new wave, indie, rock, heavy rock, heavy metal, hip hop, grime, drum and bass. These are genres that are supposed to be a bit edgy, a bit dangerous, a bit anti-establishment. You know, they don't toe the line. They don't follow the rules. They're artists. They're mavericks. They're free spirits. They express themselves. Well, they haven't been doing much of that lately, have they? Because I can't think of any big names from any of those genres that have come forward and got up there publicly and said, this whole thing is a scam. The government's lying to us. Don't believe the hype. Do your own research. They're just not saying it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be down to the fact that a great many of them are completely controlled. They're assets of the system. And they realize that if they did come forward and say something like that, they would be in very serious shit mm -hmm. because uh, they've had their careers gifted to them. They've had their careers facilitated for them. And it's on the basis that they toe the line, do what they're told and don't step out of line. They would understand this. There are some of a kind of lower level on the uh, in the pecking order who uh, would have less to fear in terms of repercussions if they were to speak out. But I think many of them are staying quiet because they don't want it to harm their career. They don't want their fan base to turn against them and think they're being irresponsible or not taking the subject seriously or whatever. And I'm sure they've been hanging on thinking, oh, we'll just see this thing out, do what the government says. And in a few more weeks, few more months, the gigs can start again and we can go back on tour and all the music clubs can open. And it must be starting to dawn on them now that that's not the plan.
The plan is not to have nightclubs open again. The plan is not to have dance festivals on the scale they were on before. The plan is not to have big gigs and arenas and stadiums like they were before. Listen to what Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, was saying just the other week. And it spoke to the contempt that this government have and the control system have towards the arts, towards anything creative, towards the music scene. He was saying to musicians and artists of all kinds, you should retrain for new careers. Mm -hmm. You should think, you know, long term, you're not going to be able to sustain a career as an artist anymore. Yeah. And this is the war on joy that I've addressed in a few of my videos recently. Yeah. So the demonic entities that are doing this to us, the architects of this COVID plan and everything that it feeds into, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset, the United Nations Agenda 2030, mm -hmm. and uh, all these other uh, agendas that this whole thing is designed to fulfill. These people, if we can even refer to them as people, because I just see them as subhuman, because to be referred to accurately as a human, you have to have all the tenets of humanity intact. Yeah, you have to have some spirituality love. about you. <laughs> yeah, some connectedness back to source. And mm -hmm. these individuals are just joyless, uh, grey, boring automatons, mm -hmm. devoid of all life, devoid of all pleasure, devoid of all joy, devoid of all happiness. And they're trying to get us to be like them. They want our lives to be as joyless and as miserable as theirs are. And if they can remove music and remove any kind of pleasurable, joyful pursuit, mm -hmm. then that helps towards that process. And isn't that what we're seeing? So right now, you can't go to the theatre, you can't go to the cinema, you can't go and watch a live music gig, you can't go to a nightclub and have a dance, you can't even go to a bar and do karaoke or listen to a band perform. You can't do any of these things. You can't even sing in church because apparently COVID's going to jump down your throat the minute you open your mouth to sing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't dance because you, you're going to swish the virus around and clouds of it are just going to go everywhere, you know. So um, it's a war on joy. It is. And there's it's a, a war on art and it's a war on culture. Yeah. There's a part of me that I keep asking, you know, and it's a question that I have for nearly everyone I know. What is your tipping point? And what I mean by that, and a few of them, my other friends have actually been asking that for their friends as well, because everybody's got their own tipping point. You had your awakening. Many people have their own in some way. But this year, whether it's an awakening or not, there's a barrier that it's going to push past. And it's going to be like, wow, I can't do this, 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 and this. And, and that's okay. Hell no. With, there's a point in everyone's life that will come down to it where people will actually say, no more. And that's different for everyone. It's some people, it's a, a forced vaccination. Some people, it's the fact that they can't rave anymore. Some people, it's the fact that they've got to wear a mask. The big one, I feel that's really going to, to kind of shake up, I'm not going to say wake up, I'm going to say shake up, waking up quite peaceful uh, in, in comparison to what's coming, I believe. But the shaking up is going to be this forced vaccination scenario. And this is where I wanted to segue. And I've listened to a lot of your stuff about common law, about natural law. And um, I've recently been starting to do a, a common law course. And I'm understanding the power of our words. And, that, and what I mean by common law, for anybody that's listening, is their natural laws of mankind were originally set for all humans on earth. But we also have a legal system that sits above the natural law, which we play into. So for example, on your driving license, you would have your name on your driving license that's actually known as a title and that title is not you it's not a human being it's usually a piece of card with your name on it and it's that piece of card with your name on it that is in the system and that is you playing in the legal system but there's also natural rights for human beings which are now becoming more aware of i know you've done some interviews uh, with i forgot the gentleman's name that you did that's taking the Michael court case Bernice, yeah, yeah exactly there's some phenomenal information coming out now that people are waking up to that i'm studying that other people are sharing the information of is that we actually do have a right. Now, this is not just about learning how to tell a policeman to go and do one and how to not get arrested or how to not pay your council tax. This is way bigger than that. What we actually have is a responsibility as a human to live in our truth. And our truth is divine. It, it literally it comes through us at every moment. We can either be in flow with that 
or we can be ignoring that. Now, if we're in flow with that, we're in God's law. We're protected and we can maintain conversations. We can come from loving places. We can be calm. We can set our boundaries. We can say what we want and what we don't want to experience. But if we come from fear or sarcasm or anger, that's when it comes hard. It becomes hard for us to state what we actually believe we are, you know, we have a right to. And that's where we have a confrontation with our legal system. And the problem that I think um, at the moment that we're experiencing, Mark, is Many people are waking up, but they're waking up in fear and then they're going to go and run for these rights and they're going to realize that they do actually have them and that they do exist and it is our law. But the delivery of those rights is going to be the downfall because you have to deliver your truth calmly. You have to learn. This is one I'm going to talk about the communication. Have to bring it down to how you communicate what you think is right for you at that time. And this is where music comes in because when you listen to a piece of music, you're happy, you're joyful, you're in a good space, you've shared, you know, you're connected. But with no music and no events and no society where you can find your joy, like you said, it's a war against joy, you automatically feel terrible, which makes you more, you know, feeling more angry, which makes you feel like you don't have any power. And then when you do try to exert your power, you're limited because you actually can't have you don't have the joy to go with it. You don't have the greater sense of love and, and, and calm and compassion. And that is what I think people are actually trying. I'm going to say people, but these humans, whoever they are, are trying to bring down every part of us because they know about the law. They know that there's a difference between natural law of mankind and the legal system. And when we find out about that en masse, it's our duty to ourselves and to those who come after us to put that law into place. But the only way we can do that is with love and compassion. So the music is something we have to come together in because that's the immediate way I believe we all connect. And you've had a conversation many times about this natural law. Is it something that you've only become aware of recently or is it something that you, you know, for, because of this year or is it something that you learned about a long time ago? I've known about it pretty much since I first woke up. It was one mm -hmm. of the early subjects that I uh, looked into. And I think inherently each of us knows deep down within the very core of us ways in which we're supposed to live and ways in which we're not supposed to live. We know the difference between right and wrong. And we're having that inherent knowledge exploited in us. So we don't need to be told that you shouldn't harm others. We just know it. We know that that's the correct way to live. We have consciences inbuilt into our humanity. That's one of the reasons why with these so-called elite types, they get subjected to satanic ritual abuse and trauma-based mind control from a very young age because they're trying to break that aspect of their humanity. They're trying to turn many of these people into psychopaths so that when they get put out there in the world in whatever role has been designed for them, whether it's a politician or uh, a musician that's going to have great influence on large numbers of people or a Hollywood actor or business leader or a religious leader or whatever it is, they've already had that part of their inherent humanity broken and they can no, no longer relate to the empathy and the compassion that everyone else in society has. So you mentioned common law there, and that is very closely aligned to the natural rights of free, sovereign humans. Mm. It recognizes that we are born with rights and freedoms that are gifted to us by the creator. And no man or woman or corporate entity can ever take those rights away from us. They might claim that they can, but in reality, they can't. We're free and sovereign. Even if we're thrown into a cage, we're still free and sovereign. We've had our personal physical movement restricted but it doesn't alter the fact that we're free and sovereign in our core nature. And this is a temporary experience and we will go back to source, uh, mm -hmm. to the spirit world when, when this life is done. So we remain free throughout it. And common law recognises the fundamental tenets of what's described as natural law, sometimes referred to as universal law, which is you should not treat others in a way you would not wish to be treated yourself. So don't cause harm. It can be summed up in, in that simplistic sentence, really. Do no harm. We all know what we don't want done to us. 
So you don't treat peop other, other people that way. Very, very simple. It's so simple, a child of five could understand it. And it speaks volumes that it's not taught in schools. What could be so harmful? Who could really have any objection to that basic rule being taught in schools? Don't treat others in a way you would not wish to be treated yourself. Mm. So the number one right in creation is to be left alone. That's it. And isn't that the way most of us just want to live our lives? Most of us have no interest in dominating or controlling others or causing harm to others. We just want to be left alone to live our lives the way we choose to live them, so long as we're causing no harm to another. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're having uh, a war waged against right now, our mm -hmm. right to be left alone because we're anything but being left alone this year. We're having every aspect of our lives intruded upon. We're being coerced. We're being put under duress. We're having all manner of harm done to us when we've done nothing to warrant it. And it's a war by those that are perpetrating all of this against natural law and against our inherent rights and freedoms. So common law, as you've pointed out there, is seemingly the remedy to what's being done to us because it is the highest law in this realm of existence because it's more closely aligned to our natural rights and freedoms than any other kind of law and the law that is practiced in the courts of the land uh that police adhere to and that governments adhere to is maritime admiralty law mm. which is of course a fiction it's a construct it has no basis in reality it relies upon us being viewed as corporate entities it doesn't view us as humans it doesn't view us as free sovereign beings mm. that whole so-called legal system is based around corporate entities and it's all done for profit and it's all completely phony and completely fake and yet most people because of the way we've been conditioned and programmed through our lives consider it to be valid and consider it to be applicable in our lives mm -hmm. so the point at which large numbers of people come to realize that common law is the way to hold wrongdoers accountable for their actions, for the harm and the damage that they have caused, is the point at which the tide can really turn in all of this. Yeah. So there are a number of cases that are being brought against the governments of the world and against different organisations now through the common law system. We have yet to see any great recognisable successes in this because it's still quite early days. But I'm holding out quite a lot of hope that uh, we can see some of the results that we want to see through this system being understood by many, many more people and put into action. Yeah, there's there's a slight difference between common law and the natural law of mankind. And I want to be very clear on this for people who are listening. The common law is our, is our right here as humans on the planet. It's basically something that we can go against the legal system with. But where the natural law of mankind comes in is actually the place in which that common law comes from within ourselves. So when we look at things energetically and metaphysically, metaphysically for those who don't know is things that you can't see. So this is physical. I'm here today and so is Mark. Anything metaphysical is the stuff that you can't see. But the difference between the two is that if you were to get stopped by a policeman and you knew your common law rights so you knew the correct language and the terminology that could get you out of being arrested that is one part of common law but the natural law of mankind is actually where you come from within you actually already energetically believe and know and hold to be true that you have done nothing wrong and when you speak from that place of certainty with love that is the place in where nothing can happen. But when you engage in common law with arrogance or you engage in common law with anger or frustration, things don't necessarily energetically go in the way you want them to because you're not coming at it from a place of love. And there's a very big difference between the two. So there's a lot of people out there now who are putting these cases forward and they're slow in their uptake. And that's largely because energy isn't used in the right way. So if you really knew, if you look at, for example, you look at David Icke for years when people have said to him, oh, you know, why haven't you died or why haven't they taken you out? And he's like, because I know he's holding it to be absolutely true that he cannot and will not and never will be affected by the opposition because he knows it to be true in his divine right as a human being, as a man here on earth that he himself is able to do as he wishes. And he's sung that song for 30 years and he has it down to a T. Now, 
many people will go out there and learn common law and it's fascinating and i'm you know i'm understanding all the different words and you know even the words you know that we use a statement is not actually a statement that we say it's actually the word state is when you actually put your somebody else into a state and the word meant is mentality so you're changing the mentality of someone when you speak to them by giving them a statement and that energetically has a difference in the language that you use in the knowing what you're about to do to someone by the very energy that you're going to use coming out of your mouth so there's a whole other angle to it which is slightly more esoteric ironically enough so even if you want to go down the common law route and you want to stand there and say I am a you know I am a man and this is my right without stepping into the spiritual aspect and the energy aspect and the esoteric part of it doesn't mean that you're always going to get away with what you want to get away with because whether you like it or not waking up is part of a human experience I believe and the spiritual aspect of really understanding the energy of it is unavoidable if you truly want to use your common rights and that's how I think a lot of people Mark that I've been looking a lot of people are going to wake up because that will be their tipping point that in itself will be like oh well I have to look at this stuff now and I have to get spiritually aligned because you need to be energetically aligned with your truth and you need to understand the power of the words that you use and you know need to know that just by your thought alone can have an effect on the outcome that you're trying to create. So if you align with all of that, you are essentially, you know, on your path, waking up as a spiritual being. But there's a lot of people that are just trying to use common law as a means to go against something which can slow things down, but it isn't necessarily all into alignment. Would you agree with that? Yeah, a lot of people are trying to use it to get Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson arrested, which uh, in my book is is no bad result to aim for. Uh, I'm, I'm all for that. But yeah, when you enter into the realm of common law, you have to know how to speak, as you were saying just there. You have to learn the correct words and phrases because the English language has been weaponized and it has been used against us. And so often when we speak, we don't understand the true meaning of the words. Understand is a good example, which... Yeah. I've I've caught myself using a couple of times in this innocent? conversation. I I, I try and yeah, I try not to use the word understand, but you know, a lifetime of programming. In a court system or in a, a police scenario, if you're asked if you understand something by a judge, for example, they're asking you if you stand under their authority and if mm -hmm. you therefore, you know, bow to them. And if you answer yes, I understand, you're not saying I comprehend, I get your meaning, you're saying I stand under your authority which is not a great thing to do. So you have to learn how to speak this stuff. You speak words to action. You speak power. And the problem with common law is somebody could be very well versed themselves in knowing how to conduct themselves, knowing how to speak, knowing what their rights are. But if you encounter the average rank and file foot soldier, thug policeman mm. who wants to get you on some statue or some, you know, bill or other and quotes this to you if you start speaking in common law terms to one of these characters they're not going to understand what the hell you're talking about sorry comprehend what the hell you're talking about and they're just going to want to throw you in the van and, and take you down the station and throw you in a cell because mm -hmm. they think you're being insolent and they think you're trying to resist their authority or whatever they don't realize that uh, you know what you're talking about far more than they do because they only, only only understand these statutes coming out of the maritime law system and such mm -hmm. so that can be uh, a bit of a problem. Just picking up on what you said about David Icke there as well, I just wanted to address that. People have opinions about David Icke and all day they'll tell you, oh, he's an insider, he's a shill, he never really left the BBC, I don't trust him and all this. Say what you like about him, but yeah. when it comes to that statement that he's made consistently over many years, that absolutely resonates with me. And I feel that applies in my life as well. So many times he's been asked, David, if you're the real deal, how come the system haven't taken you out for the pain in the ass that you've become and all the information you reveal? And he says, they don't take me out because they can't, because I won't allow it. I won't entertain that possibility. And he was talking one time about an event that he did, a big speaking event, and the organisers had laid on a couple of bodyguards for him so that when he left the stage and walked back to his car, he had these bodyguards. And he said, I don't want the bodyguards. Send them away because me having bodyguards brings in the fear. is an acceptance of the possibility that something harmful could happen to me. Yeah. Me sending away the bodyguards is me having no attachment to that possibility whatsoever. It's not going to come into my reality. And I really feel that that is a genuine dynamic that has worked for him. Mm. And it's worked for me because 
I feel I've been protected these past 10 years. Uh, you know, I've been able to do what I need to do relatively unimpeded mm -hmm. because I take that same attitude as well, that I'm going to be fine. No harm is going to come into my world. I'm going to do what I came here to do. So that's a very valid thing. I just wanted to make that point. Also, we were talking earlier about what it would take for large numbers of people to wake up. What would be their tipping point? What would be their line in the sand? And again, circling back to music, there's a lot of people I know personally who were very much into partying, raving, going to see live gigs, going to see musicians perform. And they've not been able to do that this year. But they've had all their hopes pinned on, on summer year. 2021 being the one. And I've seen conversations on mm. Facebook threads and such. And people have said, well, you know, it's been a tough year, but we just got to sit it out. Next year, we'll be back in Ibiza. The clubs will be open. The festivals will be back on. We can go to the gigs. And they think it's all going to come back next year. Now, if we get to summer 2021 and none of that has returned and we're still being fed all these bogus uh, scare stories and all this propaganda. Mm -hmm. There's going to be legions and armies of music fans mm -hmm. who are going to be mighty pissed off and are going to be forced by that point to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there's far more going on here than they thought. Yeah. That's going to be a phenomenal force going up against the control system as and when those times come around. I totally agree. I had that conversation the other day. It it, it's so I get uncomfortable when people talk about 2021. I really do because I hope I hope I am wrong. I hope every single part of what I have come to learn and know. I hope it's not true, and we are rolling around at our next festivals. You know, in the summer of 2021, I really yeah, no masks, hope that. no distancing, no masks, raving, no distancing. Everyone can hug and kiss and do what the hell you want. I just feel within the gut and within my soul that we have to do something in order to make that happen because it won't happen naturally and we won't come back into the same kind of life we want just left and it really does it excites me in a way because i feel we're going to see different versions of people than we've ever seen we're going to see the greatest versions of people because they're going to actually fight to live and i don't want them to fight but they're going to you know they're going to grow and they're going to want to live like they've never wanted to live before and that's when the best version of someone can come out when you can really get to that space these people who at the moment don't really get it or are just not engaging in it which is okay if you if that's where you want to be that's your you know that's your particular position but the best versions of us come out when we're under pressure and not that I want to bring on more pressure, but I do want to bring on better versions of people. I want as many of the best versions of human beings we can get on the planet. And I want them here ASAP, like <laughs> yesterday. But I know that we have to keep doing what we're doing, the interviews like this and helping people and, and just really not trying to wake people up, but just trying to share the information from a place that can be accepted. So what I mean by that is don't force your information into people. Don't bombard them with a million text messages or WhatsApp or, you know, continuous notifications. Just say, are you happy to have that conversation with me right now? Is there anything you want to talk about? Can we can we go into that? Or do you want me to send you any information first and foremost? Because that way you're communicating in a way that they can accept. They can say yes or no and they'll be coming from a, a different place they'll be coming with more questions because they'll be in a space where they feel like they're learning they're not being taught and it's got to be this way and it's got to be that way because curiosity comes when you're actually willing to learn and if they're not willing to learn you're never going to teach them a thing yeah and in the same way that you get the best version of people when their backs are against the wall mm -hmm. and when they're under pressure it's always been that way with music and with songs some of the most incredibly touching, emotional, inspirational, uplifting, resonant songs in the history of music have been produced by artists in conditions of, of duress and hardship and suffering. Mm -hmm. Whether it's been written during times of war, or whether it's been written by people living in uh, oppressive conditions in some ghetto somewhere, living in poverty, uh, living... <clears throat> in all kinds of challenging social situations, it seems to bring out the best in musicians. They produce their best material when they're under pressure. Yeah. And it's that way with uh, every expression of, of our lives. Uh, when everything's comfortable and everything's uh, hunky-dory and everything's going well, yeah. uh, you have no reason to, to, to be uh, overly creative and overly expressive. But when <clears throat> your natural ways of life are being threatened, and when things aren't that comfortable for you 
and when you're a bit on edge, uh, that tends to bring out the most creative, imagin imaginative elements of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to see that play out, I'm sure, as things continue, whatever next year looks like. And I yeah. share your hopes that we're wrong in predicting hardship next year. It would be a beautiful thing to be able to return to our, our natural ways of living, our joyful ways of living, just mm -hmm. being able to express ourselves fully, the full range of human emotions, being able to be social with people again, just uh, being happy and uh, expressive. I would love nothing more than for that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to see, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Either way, we'll know soon enough how this whole thing is going to play out. Indeed, we are. Well, I think we'll leave it on that positive end that we all have the power to be able to change this if we're wanting to, willing to, and, you know, the answers will come, the solutions will be there. And uh, it's people like you, Mark, that make me very happy and you do great research. And as I said, again, I'm going to show your book one more time. Go get it, everyone. It's amazing. It's musical truth. Um, and there's volume two as well. Yeah, yeah, yes, there's volume two as well. Don't give me anything else to read this side of Christmas, please. <laughs> I'm already getting through it. But uh, yeah, this has been really good. Thank you. And before you go, can you please tell everyone where we can find your stuff? I will have it underneath as well, but just let people know where they can hear more of you. Sure. Well, I've got a main website, which was put together for me by uh, a guy from America earlier this year, my new webmaster. He reached out and offered to construct a wow. new website. He's done an awesome job. Very, very grateful for that. So that's all at djmarkdevlin.com. So that's like a one-stop shop. You can access all my videos from there. You can get all my podcasts. All my material is accessible from that point. My YouTube is youtube.com slash TV. And I put regular videos up on there each weekend, giving my thoughts and reflections on things. Got a few things to say this coming weekend. Uh, all my radio interviews go up on there as well. Uh, so that's Mark Devlin TV on YouTube. Musical Truth Volume 3 will be coming as soon as I get the time to write it. So I'm kind of earmarking 2021 as the year where I get that book written with a view to it being out in early 2022. So other than that, just want to thank you for a great chat today. Uh, you're an awesome my host. Pleasure. Thank and you. I really enjoyed uh, the places we went with this conversation, which differed from most of the other interviews I've done this year. It's nice to just uh, discuss some different things from time to time. Thank you. Well, you can see from the glow on my face. I'm very happy. I'm just like, I've been waiting for this interview. We were meant to do it last week, weren't we? And I, I couldn't, unfortunately, but I'm glad we waited and I'm glad uh, we've got you in. And there's, as I said, there's so many other things I want to talk to you about, but we'll just leave it here for now. And hopefully we'll have you back at some point. And also just to let everyone know who's listening is Mark's going to be joining our radio station for I Am Sound as well. So we're going to get some of Mark's music on there as well. And um, we're going to be doing another, hopefully another interview with you more about your music style and all that kind of background as well, which would be great if you accept and uh yeah you can go to check out www.imsoundacademy.com for more and if you want any more information from me the links are below but for the rest of you thank you so much for listening and if you have any questions please make some comments thanks for now bye cheers bye yay that's amazing